Either it's he's the God of the Jews and the Christians are wrong or vice versa. But this guy was actually bringing them both together in a way I'd never heard or comprehended before. And that was it. So he threw my life upside down and uh, it took me a long time to sort of uh, put the pieces together again. And several months later in England, I finally realised that Jesus in fact was uh, the Messiah and he was the, uh, the one that in a sense filled the vacuum in my life. He was the one that I was searching for. But it was only when I really saw Jesus in that Jewish way, Jesus being a Jew and how the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel would precede the return of Jesus. When I saw that connection, then I began to seriously consider who is Jesus. Now you mentioned this pastor from CMJ. Was it Al Sawyer? No, his name was David Price. He David preceded Price. Alfred David, Sawyer. He preceded Alfred Sawyer. Yeah, I remember David Price. Um, what, what does CMJ stand for? CMJ is Church's Ministry Among the Jewish People. Right. And it was established in 1809 in London. And it really was the first Christian organization to step out and have a, a vision for the Jewish people. Yes, it desired to present Jesus as Messiah to the Jewish people, but there's a lot more to it than just, uh, than just that. Yeah, no kidding. I, 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 uh, I've got one of your um, uh, DVDs here, uh, The Cyrus Call. Shaftesbury, Wilberforce, Palmerston, Spurgeon, General Allenby, Riley, Cromwell, uh, McChain, also, Queen Victoria uh, was, was involved. I mean, th this was a, a very uh, remarkable organization in its early uh, beginnings. Well, not all those folks were involved with CMJ. Some were directly. But CMJ itself was an organization which represented the mindset of evangelical Christianity in Britain in that time. We really have to go back to the Puritan period to see that during the time of the Puritans, many, many Bible-believing Christians in England had this vision for Israel's restoration out of the message of Jesus going back to the Jewish people. Because don't forget that for centuries, the established church said, nah, we don't even take the gospel to them, the message of Jesus to them. But also some of these people from the Puritan period onwards saw that according to the scriptures, the covenant promises to Abraham, Romans 9, 10, 11, and so on and so forth, that the Jewish nation would be restored in the latter days. And so by the time of the early 1800s, that mindset was, was growing in Britain, which led to the formation of CMJ. Later, yes, Wilberforce was involved as one of our first vice presidents, and Lord Shaftesbury was the vice president and then president from 1835 up until 1885. So that's a long span of well, time. That's 50 years. That's 50 years. Yeah. Um, but other people like Charles Spurgeon, for instance, was never associated with CMJ because that was an Anglican-based society. Mm. Spurgeon was more involved with the British Jew Society. Mm. But nevertheless, he was still part of the same mindset. Robert Murray McChain and many others as well. And the combination of all those factors, as well as people like Lord Palmerston, who might not have been a Bible-believing Christian, but he's related by marriage to Lord Palmerston, and so to Lord Shaftesbury. So the combination of all those factors meant that that organization was a platform for this whole British involvement in the restoration of Israel. When you look at the 1917 Balfour Declaration, for instance, it wasn't just something which fell out of the sky. And it was by no, by no means just an initiative of, of the Zionist organization itself. No, it was built upon a foundation that went back 300 years in British evangelical Christian history. Yeah. Um, Christchurch, which is a beautiful uh, building now, just inside the Jaffa Gate in the Old City. Um, as I was reading your book, I was surprised to discover it was... Um, initially a part of a, like a British consulate, right? It, it, because at that time, under the, was it under the Turks? That's right. Uh, the uh, Brits weren't allowed to build any new churches. Not just the British. Nobody was allowed to build new churches. It was a violation of Islamic law to build new churches. Right. So it became a part of the British uh, presence in, uh, in Israel. Um, at the, during those early days, the... Uh, the Jewish people living in Israel, in most cases, were pretty hard pressed. Uh, life was, was tough for them, right? That's right, because there was a system under the Turks, an Islamic system called Dimi system, whereby at the top of the ladder, it was like a ladder, a social ladder at the top were the Muslims, okay, the Turks or the Arabs, etc. Underneath them were all the other communities from the Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholics, Armenians, down to the smaller churches. And right at the very bottom were the Jewish people. Now that was the, the status quo of the time. And the Turks basically said, this is the way it is. It's been like this for centuries and it's not going to change. In other words, nobody could go up and down the ladder and nobody knew could come onto the ladder. 
That's why when CMJ first made the attempts to go in there, they could not establish their presence because they were not a community, were not a recognised community. And it's a whole story in itself as how that happened. It's really the, the sovereignty of God working through history. But as pertaining to the Jewish people, they were at the bottom of the ladder yeah. and that's the way it was going to be. And it's very interesting to note that the first community that really came in that helped them were the British and the workers from CMJ. And we could see how their social status changed thereafter, developed sometimes directly as a result of the work of CMJ and the British consulate, but oftentimes as a reaction to it, they began to establish their own institutions. And it was interesting, the relationship between Britain and, uh, and CMJ in those early days. Um, it was, you, they really were joined at the hip. I mean, CMJ was almost like an extension of a British worldview about, about Israel, was it not? It certainly was. And uh, again, for my, in my opinion, this is one of those times when I think you see the finger of God intervening in history. And if you look at it geopolitically, at that period of time, Britain was beginning to be very concerned about the Eastern Mediterranean because in 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Egypt in an endeavour to get down and kick the British out of India. Okay? And the British came in under Nelson and defeated him, and so on and so forth. But as a result of that, the British government had a foreign policy thereafter from 1800s onwards, which was to keep rival European powers away from the Eastern European zone, either the French from the, what later became the Suez Canal area, or the Russians away from the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles. So that was Britain's foreign policy, right? So like India was down here, mm. so it was like a, a magnet pulling Britain into the Middle East thereafter. Now, if it was just that, if it was just geopolitics, well, who knows which way the British government would have gone at that stage. But then